Hello, I'm Professor Robert Dunn. We'll be talking about the spine consultation. The learning objectives are for you to take a history of an approach to a musculoskeletal examination, particularly around spinal pathology, and have an approach to a differential diagnosis, differentiating largely between spine, upper limb, and lower limb pathology. The consultation, like any other, is about establishing a relationship the obvious one being a medical relationship between a patient and a doctor. However, there's a person-to-person -person emotional relationship. We will travel together down the natural history of this condition, the intervention, adverse outcomes, good outcomes, and even death. There's a financial relationship between a seller and a purchaser in the private practice arena. You will be selling your service to the patient, which may cause some conflict with the other relationships and needs to be managed carefully. But likewise, as a doctor in the public service, you're responsible for the appropriate allocation of resources of the state. You need to ensure that in a, in a resource-constrained environment, that the patient that's going to benefit the most is being allocated resource and is not a wasteful allocation. And then finally, there's a legal relationship between a provider and a client. And depending how the other three relationships go, the legal one might become more important. All these relationships result in expectations, obligations, and consequences. And the outcome of our intervention and management of this patient is dictated by the interaction of these relationships. We'll focus on the medical relationship for the purposes of this talk, where sequentially a history, examination, and special investigations are done. It's important to avoid the temptation to start with the special investigations as many important uh, bits of information will be missed and you're likely to come to a misdiagnosis. The vast majority of the information is provided by the history and quite frequently by the end of the history a physician is in a position to make a diagnosis. The history allows for data gathering to make a diagnosis, identifying comorbidities that may have an impact on the possible surgery, it allows an opportunity to develop insight into the patient's makeup, to establish whether the patient is a good surgical candidate from the outset, limiting resource appropriation to the incorrect patients, and establishing a good doctor-patient relationship with a positive impact on surgical outcome and reduction of litigation. The data gathering starts with the current complaint, which is generally expressed by the patient or their caregivers, such as the parent if the child is the patient. This can be difficult to express. We are pretty used to dealing with low-end patients, children, low levels of education, language barriers, and have strategies to develop to, to deal with these issues. However, we can be quite intimidated by high-end patients that we meet for the first time in private practice, generally speaking, who are pseudo-intellectuals, they Google, um, they use a lot of incorrect words, self-diagnose, which can be disconcerting and um, result in the incorrect diagnosis being made. Terminology that is frequently used by the patient, such as sciatica, uh, will misinform the surgeon because as a doctor we understand sciatica to mean radicular pain, nerve root complaints, irritation of a nerve root causing buttock, leg, foot pain in an L4, 5, S1 distribution whereas the patient may use this term for back pain. Chronic, again, to the surgeon or doctor, is long-standing pain, which will make us think of certain types of pathology. The patient may use this to, to convey severe pain. And back pain, the patient often misinterprets buttock pain as back pain, when in fact back pain to this physician means pain inside, in, in the axial skeleton of the lumbar spine itself, whereas buttock pain is frequently L5 nerve root pain and maybe a form of sciatica. When interrogating the current complaint, we need to think about pain, function, and deformity. Remembering orthopedic surgery is about these elements rather than and less frequently life and death. We're more focusing around pain, function, and deformity. We need to talk about the onset of pain. How did it start? Was there something, remembering that people often attribute an accident or some event mistakenly to the cause of the pain. How did this pain develop? Was it acute? Did it start suddenly? Or did it slowly build up over time? 
such as tuberculosis of the spine, will be an insidious onset. There won't be a, a day the patient can say, where as opposed to um, an acute, it might have been, you know, I picked up a heavy computer uh, from the back seat of my car, I get acute back pain, pain down the leg. That'd be more typical of a disc herniation. Is this pain episodic or constant? Episodic is more in keeping with the degenerative situation, exacerbated by activity, whereas constant pain is more in keeping with infection or cancer. Has this pain deteriorated over time? If not, why is the patient chosen to present now? Is there a social stressor, something happening at work that needs to be looked at rather than surgery? Can we quantify how bad this pain is? How often, how frequently does this pain occur over a period of time? Once a week, once a month, once a quarter? Is it back pain or is it ridiculous? Is it nerve root pain down the leg or the arm? What, what is the effect of this pain on activity? The patient might think this is the end of the world, but yet there's no limitation on sporting activity or sleep, work or sex. It's important to determine this. What about Valsalva? When the to patient goes to the toilet and presses, does the pain shoot down the leg in keeping with an acute disc herniation? Are there bladder and bowel sensory changes, incontinence? Is there loss of weight in keeping with uh, cancer or infection? We need to interrogate what's been done so far. Frequently these patients have seen other doctors, have a, other interventions. What advice were they given? What was the effect of facet blocks? anti-inflammatories, physiotherapy. If nothing's helped, nothing is likely to help. There may be, have been a few or three days of improvement after some of these modalities. It's important to understand this. By this point, you should have a differential diagnosis and need to obtain a holistic picture of the patient. Ask about their past medical history. Are there comorbidities, peripheral vascular disease, other joint involvement suggestive of an inflammatory arthritis? Do they have blood pressure issues, ischemic heart disease? Do they take blood thinners, which may affect our surgery? Be careful. Ask any medication on a regular basis. Patients hold back. They often don't tell you about antihypertensives if their blood pressure is controlled. They're embarrassed by their depression. Don't speak about the SSRIs. And they don't talk about homeopathy. Yet many of the, anti, the homeopathic agents are anticoagulants. If a genetic condition is suspected, Ask about family history. In a child, ask about development. Do they sit, walk, talk on time? Or is there a cognitive delay indicative of a syndrome? Ask about previous surgery. Are there social stresses, marriage, children, social support? Do they have stairs to their house? Will they be able to be discharged after surgery? Do they smoke? Not only does this have respiratory consequences, but also bone healing impairment. Do they drink too much? What work do they do? Elderly men doing heavy manual labor are unlikely ever to go back to work after surgery. And possibly looking at work options is better than looking at surgery. What sports and hobbies do they want to go back to? Are they realistic? The examination starts from when we call the patient into the waiting room. Here is a teenager with difficulty getting up off the floor. This is called a Gower sign. This is indicative of muscular weakness, of an underlying neuromuscular condition such as Duchenne's or, and spinal muscular atrophy. Here's a child with multiple hyperpigmented lesions on his skin. This is indicative of neurofibromatosis, which causes non-union of the tibia, causes scoliosis. A young boy with in a wheelchair, low slung ears, slanty eyes. Strange thumb, in keeping with a diastrophic dysplasia, which comes along with kyphoscoliosis. Two children with Marfans. The girl on the left exhibiting a scoliosis seen with a, a thoracic prominence posteriorly, a flank crease, long arms, arachnodactyly spider-like fingers, both wearing glasses as they get lens problems. The boy's got a kyphosis from poor uh, muscular and, and ligamentous laxity. He's got a uh, pectus carinatum, deformity of his anterior sternum and chest wall. Look for the tuft of hair on the base of the spine, often associated with spinal dysraphism. Here the MRI scan, scan shows the split cord deformity with the bony bar. Broad neck in a young boy with a totally disorganized scoliosis due to congenital hemivertebra. 
child in a wheelchair, not using her arms due to spinal muscular atrophy. Cock robin deformity of the twist of the turned rotated chin, slightly tilted neck due to C12 atlanto axial pathology. Flattened buttocks, heart shaped, indicative of an L5 S1 lysthesis. We need to assess balance. Are the shoulders level? Are they parallel to the floor and the hips? How does the patient ambulate? Are they able to stand up on their tiptoes? Indicative of normal S1 power. Can they stand on their heels? L5 for dorsiflexion. Do they have normal lumbar rotation? Flexion, extension, lateral bending. Do a neurological examination for power sensation reflexes. We screen the hip for hip pathology and check for distal pulses as these are all differential diagnoses. Here's a patient with a right high stepping gait and less, and, and more, and, uh, less obvious on the left. You can see that she has a drop foot. She never dorsiflexes that foot. And this is an example of a, trin of a drop foot gait. Looking closely, you will see that not only does she have that, but she also has a Trendelenburg gait. Look at that, how she swings her shoulder across to the left, indicative of a Trendelenburg gait. So not only does she have a drop foot gait, but she has weak hip abductors, both innervated by L5, suggestive of L5 pathology. Here's a man walking with very stiff legs, indicative of a myelopathy, upper motor neuron symptoms, in this case a cervical myelopathy. Look at how stiff those knees are, he never really bends them, shows increased tone in the gait. He is asked to flex and extend his fingers. Note particularly the left hand is unable to do this normally. You can see how the fingers are abnormal in their function. Indicative of cervical myelopathy. Here's the Hoffman sign where the, you flick the third finger and see there's involuntary flexion of the thumb. This is indicative of cervical myelopathy. 16% of normal people will have this and the sign alone is not indicative of the pathology but in line with the other gait and other signs you're about to see will confirm uh, cervical myelopathy. This is an example of the finger escape sign where the patient is asked to hold his hands out with his fingers tightly together. Notice how the right pinky is already started to move to the side. He's trying to correct it but he can't. And as you see on the left hand side, the pinky is about, there it goes. Pinky, that's called a positive finger escape sign. Here's an example of clonus. Our registrar is flexing the knee slightly to relax the gastrocnemius, jerks the heel, and you can see there is sustained clonus. This is indicative of an upper motor neuron signs. There's pathology in the spinal cord, either in the cervical or thoracic area. The Babinski, by stimulating the soul, you can see the immediate upgoing hallux. It should normally go down then up. It's immediately up. In this case, it's so severe, there's in fact clonus caused when we do this. And finally, we'll look at special investigations, whether those be x-rays, some form of scan like a CT or MRI scan, blood tests, nerve conduction tests as appropriate. It's very important to check these yourself and not rely on reports as they're often inaccurate. Now, often the cervical pathology can be confused with upper limb pathology. Here's an example of a patient who has both severe neck degeneration on x-ray as well as marked glenohumeral arthritis. As we age, we all get degeneration in our neck and the presence on x-ray does not mean it's symptomatic. MRI changes likewise may be present without being symptomatic. And so one needs to take a history and examine the upper limb to make sure the problem is not in the upper limb itself. There are many causes of arm pain. Generally speaking, a sign of shoulder pathology is the lack of shoulder motion. This first presents with inability to get the arm above your head, problems with internal rotation such as brushing your hair, getting your hand behind your head, or putting your hand to scratch between your shoulder blades. 
when lying on the arm, you tend to get pain on the same side. Whereas if it's neck pathology, when you lie down, uh, you tend to get pain on the contralateral side. If there's sensory changes in the upper limb, it's more commonly due to neck pathology. When examining the patient and causing compression of the spine by putting pressure down on the head, longitudinally rotating the head towards the side of the pain and laterally bending it, doing Spurling's test should cause pain, increasing pain in the upper limb if it's foraminal stenosis from a disc herniation. Glenohumeral pathology can radiate down the arm, but is usually lim presents with limited range of motion. It can be tenderness anterior to the glenohumeral joint where the cuff is, and there may be a painful arc. The pain may abduct the arm, have pain, but when they get through that range of motion, the pain improves again. There may be weakness on testing the supraspinatus muscle, and obviously if you inject the subacromial space, there might be improvement in pain if it's related to the supraspinatus tendon and rotator cuff compression. Pain down to the side of the elbow can be due to C5-6 disc and a C6 radiculopathy. However, it can also be due to local pathology such as tennis elbow. This is due to pathology in the extensor, extensor origin. This can be excluded with Mills test where the patient has resisted dorsiflexion of the wrist. They get incredible pain in the lateral aspect of the elbow when you do this. Or the, Mills, or the test where you ask them to extend the middle finger against, again against resistance and causing pain in the lateral elbow. Pain around the wrist can also come from the neck, but likewise, local pathology such as de Quervain's tenosynovitis can cause this. This is due to first compartment problems. The Finkelstein's test is pathognomonic. The uh, thumb is flexed into the palm of the hand and it is medially flexed. This causes severe pain in the lateral aspect of the wrist should it be due to local tenosynovitis. Grinding of the thumb. Pressure on the thumb and rotating it, if causing pain in the hand, is due to carpal arthritis, not from the neck. Be cautious. Cardiac pathology, such as angina, dichromatic irritation from atelectasis or subphrenic abscesses can all cause shoulder tip pain. Here's a patient who presents with ptosis. Notice the dropped lid on the right-hand side. He's previously had a carpal tunnel release because of his right arm pain. His neck x-ray looks normal, but on the AP one can quite clearly see the destruction of the transverse process of T1 and the first rib on the right hand side due to a lung tumor called Pancoast tumor. Carpal tunnel syndrome is often confused with cervical pathology where there is numbness and pain, particularly at night, in the thumb and lateral three and a half fingers. Often the patients confirm that they are woken and they shake it out. Sometimes they complain of the whole hand being involved, but ask them to, to check when it happens again, touch their little finger and they will find that the sensation is normal. Likewise, lumbar pathology is frequently confused with lower limb pathology. Hip being the most common and is inf not infrequently missed. Patients with hip pathology tend to walk with crutches. Spinal patients infrequently require crutches. Hip patients typically have a limp, antalgic gait, pain in the groin, and classically pain in the groin on internal rotation. We are taught that hip pain can radiate down to, but not beyond the knee. But unfortunately, it is not true. And that's why often pain in the foot can be due to hip pathology and is confusing in the diagnosis. Here's an example of a patient with lupus presented with severe L5 radicular pain down to the dorsum of the foot and the hallux. An MRI scan was normal of the spine. Including the hips, you can see avascular necrosis of the left hip. You can see the hypo uh, uh, signal, the reduced signal in the hip head, indicative of death of the femoral head. Soft tissue pathology, such as hamstring tightness, can be due to local injury. Deep vein thrombosis can cause calf pain. Peripheral neuropathy from diabetes will, can confuse one with the symptoms of lumbar stenosis, but diabetes typically causes glove and stocking distribution involving the upper limbs as well, whereas lumbar pathology generally is low limb only, obviously low limb only, but 
often only ipsilateral. Frequently there can be confusion between vascular stenosis or vascular insufficiency and spinal stenosis. Vascular insufficiency causes pain on activity as does spinal stenosis. But vascular symptoms are rapidly resolved with rest where spinal stenosis tends to improve over a few minutes. Patients with spinal stenosis tend to have relief by leaning forward and will often say that they battle to walk from the car to the shop. But once in the shop and on a trolley, leaning on a trolley, they can walk all day. Vascular pathology is not dermatomal. There may be skin changes. There may be a pulse deficit. But many older patients can have both vascular and spinal stenosis. And it can be quite tricky to work out which is the most severe and requires the, the first intervention. And occasionally... It can be local pathology such as this 44-year-old runner who had shin pain, blamed on shin splints for ages, but on with an increasing palpable mass was diagnosed with a primary bone tumor. Occasionally there can be um, deformity in the spine and you can see here patient presents with pain, L5 root pain going down the leg. Here you can see a vertebral body, L5, which has slipped off S1. Here's S1, it has slipped forward, and there is stenosis here at the L5 nerve root in the foramen, typical of a lytic lysesis, a spondolytic spondylolysesis. Here you can see L5 body sitting on S1. It should be lined up here, but it slipped right forward. Here's an example of a patient who presents with low back pain equina, which is change in bulk and bladder control, sensation loss in the perineal area. If you look carefully, you can see a lytic, which means bone destructive lesion, with a margin over here. There's bone destruction in this area in the sacrum, which turned out to be hydatid disease. Herpes zoster can cause pain and vesicles in a dermatomal distribution, such as represented here. And here's a 75-year-old lady who presents with severe left L5 nerve root pain after step, stepping off a single step. If you look very closely in the pelvis, you'll see that over here there is a small step. And on a uh, magnified view, you can see the step and an insufficiency osteoporotic-related fracture over here. The reason she has L5 nerve root symptoms is the L5 nerve root comes out from L5, runs over the anterior aspect of the ala of the sacrum and out through the piriformis um, area. Um, and this area will cause irritation to the alumbosacral plexus and pain down the leg. So after assessing the patient by means of history, examination, special investigation, the surgeon or doctor should be in a position to make a differential diagnosis, hopefully a definitive diagnosis, may need further investigations, may decide on a, to watch the patient with a clinical review in the future, may offer surgery or discharge with reassurance. Importantly, adequate documentation must be made to note the current findings for future comparison as well as distribute to your colleagues um, to look after this patient and even for medical legal purposes should they be required in the future. Thank you.